Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today we're going to talk about Trisha Rose's Black Noise, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America. And I'm doing this book uh, because a few weeks ago, well, this isn't the only reason, but a few weeks ago I had done Bell Hooks's Eating the Other, and I thought that this would be a good follow-up to that because at the end of that text, if you remember, if, if you listened, you don't have to have listened to that one to know what's going on here, but at the end of that text, Bell Hooks pretty much says that uh, like hip hop culture and black male youth culture is in itself kind of oppressive to proper struggles against oppression. And Trisha Rose takes a diametrically different approach to uh, black culture and, and rap music, specifically looking at the ways in which that they can foster uh, some kind of group solidarity against oppression. But it's a lot more complicated than that. So uh, yeah. <laughs> But before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you like what I do here, or maybe I should say if you're new here, uh, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts in an accessible way. So make sure to like, share, subscribe so you can see my videos that I release every week, sometimes twice a week. And if you found me on YouTube, you'd, you'd be able to find this anywhere you get podcasts and vice versa. If you found me in podcast form. Sometimes I release videos on YouTube if you're into that at all. And if you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. Now, don't want to waste any more of your time. Let's jump into Trisha Rose's Black Noise. And just like any other book, it starts with an introduction. And in, in the introduction, she s seeks to set out the kind of timber of the book. And much like the book's subject matter, uh, that is rap, Rose embodies... Uh, a kind of contradictory identity herself, being a biracial woman from the from the Bronx. So this is a theme that's going to come up again and again in this book, specifically the idea of contradiction and how certain progressive movements embody a degree of contradiction. And one of the ways that she looks at that in terms of rap music is the way that rap music both calls attention to oppression, especially oppression directed at uh, black youth, as it is mostly described in this text, but also uh, Latina and Latino youth in many urban settings across the United States and in and, and other cities as well. She, she's, she describes the ways in which these movements are, or these musical styles are marred by their own uh, oppressive tendencies as well. So we see in rap, not only an attempt to challenge stuff like uh, police brutality, for example, or political corruption, anything like that. But there are also kind of tacit uh, codes that reinscribe notions about heteronormativity, about um, you know restrictive ideas of monogamy uh, and heterosexual comp couplings that really, in, to some extent, limit I its potential. But Rose chooses in in a very interesting way to show that um, actually this contradiction is what gives it a, some degree of power that it might otherwise not have. And more specifically, she wants to highlight that rap is no different than any other genre, any other kind of movement in this way. Every movement embodies some degree of contradictions. If there was a movement that wasn't contradictory at all, then there wouldn't be any way to oppose it in any in any sense, and people would just submit to it. Uh, so there are always these contradictions, and rather than trying to iron them out or pointing to rap music as failing in some measure because of these contradictions, she instead wants to work with them. So she writes, much of rap's critical force grows out of the cultural potency that racially segregated conditions foster. And the I guess the goal of this book for her is to examine the complex and contradictory relationships between forces of racial and sexual domination, black cultural priorities, and popular resistance in contemporary rap music. And also she's interested in how women rappers revise sexist discourse. So what we're going to get throughout the course of this book, at least at the, in the first couple of chapters, is a history of rap music. And this kind of develops not only into its uh, the technological implications and how various technologies motivated the emergence of rap, but also the socioeconomic political conditions that motivated it as well, as well as its connection to previous art forms, uh, especially musical ones, 
that are indebted to to black artists specifically rock uh jazz blues r and b uh of which rap can be seen as both an extension as both a kind of successor and as well uh a kind of rupture marking marking a move into something different and then upon establishing that she then begins to look at the kind of messages that rap music tries to convey and how it challenges and how it calls attention to various forms of oppression before finally considering specifically the way that women rappers are both framed within the rap community and by people looking from the outside in most often uh, white commentators, academics, you know, scholars of um, the music scholars and whatnot, and how women's voices, even within this already marginalized subsector of society that is uh, rappers, even within that, women undergo another degree of, um, I guess, marginalization or another degree of silencing, which just speaks to, for anyone familiar, to uh, the notion of intersectionality that pretty much states qu quite accurately that women of color will experience discrimination in a more, I will say, intense form than black men because they both have to contend with their being racialized in a negative way and also gendered in that uh, women are subordinated. Now, she's clear in, in the introduction that she can't cover everything about rap. So she hones in on four main points that I've already kind of elucidated, but this is in her terms. So firstly, she wants to overview the history of rap and hip hop in relationship to New York's post-industrial urban terrain. Secondly, she wants to look at rap's musical and technological interventions. Thirdly, she wants to look at rap's racial politics, institutional critiques, and media and institutional responses. And finally, she wants to look at rap's sexual politics, particularly female rappers' critiques of men and the feminist debates that surround women rappers. So that really describes the trajectory of the text here very well. And that propels us into chapter one, Voices from the Margins. So in broad terms, rap is either applauded for being an educational tool uh, to the uh, burning problems of racism and economic oppression, or it is chastised for promoting violence, uh, illegal sampling as being one element of it, uh, and, you know, just being just generally um, antagonistic to dominant forms of, of knowledge or like political organization or anything like that. So Rose sums up these concerns with these questions, with the following questions. Can violent images really incite violent action? Can music set the stage for political mobilization? Do sexually explicit lyrics contribute to the moral breakdown, quote unquote, breakdown of society? And finally, is this really, is rap really music anyways? And if these questions weren't already difficult enough, Rose points to, I guess, contradictory elements of rap, like how it often, as I've already said, how it often calls for both like self-responsibility in the face of systemic oppression, all the while calling attention to uh, the way that neoliberal ideology pushes people to solve problems on their own rather than approaching them in terms of, uh, you know, broad scale, uh, systemic um, challenges. Or besides that as well, how women rappers often call attention to sexism while defending their sometimes their own misogynistic uh, views of their of their male counterparts so that maintain the misogynistic views uh, that their male counterparts um, have. And to these contradictions, Rose contends that we are not presented with a lack of intellectual clarity. It's not as though these people are just like stupid and that that is the reason that they there are these contradictions. They instead reflect the contradictions that are present in all walks of life, as I've kind of already said. But what is what is rap? How do we how do we really define it? And it'll come to be more and more clear as we go on, specifically the distinction between rap and hip hop, because there is one and it's important to consider as well. And what Rose gives us here is only part of that conversation because it's a very complicated one. But she defines rap or says that rap music is a form of rhymed storytelling accompanied by highly rhythmic and electronically based music. It emerged in New York in the 70s by African Americans and Afro Caribbean uh, youths alongside breakdancing and graffiti as two uh, kind of 
um, accompanying art forms. And within rap music, the lyrics often reflect the lived reality of those people, that is, urban youth of color, primarily black people within the United States. They communicated how they learned to navigate gang life, cope with loss um, that was happening all the time. And we see this actually heightened with like uh, the AIDS uh, crisis within um, many, many black communities, even to this day, uh, and how this comes out in a kind of testimonial form in rap music. Now for women, there, there is a little bit of a difference in that for women, lyrics often reflected those just mentioned, like the concerns about loss and and gang violence and stuff like that, as well as the specific misogynistic hardships experienced by by young women. So they were speaking in an intersectional way to both their experiences as black people within an urban setting, but also their experiences as women within that same setting. Now this might explain, that is, in the way that black um, music here, in the case of rap, in the way that it calls attention to systemic forms of oppression, just general hardships experienced by black youth on the streets, this might explain why rap is targeted by dominant race, uh, by the dominant race and class that seeks to police black bodies, especially when those bodies talk back. Now, despite this, from about 1979 onwards, rap was emerging as a lucrative uh, musical genre. And it was being consumed not only by black youth, but as many other different uh, races as well, where white suburban youth were consuming it at a very high rate as well. And this in no way belies or betrays its commitment to the experiences of black Americans. This, in the same way that rock and roll, jazz, blues before it, white people just happened to take it up uh, after it got popular, or they certainly catalyzed its recognition in the popular, um, kind of in the popular imagination of American life. That is, by popular, I just mean those with the most power began to recognize it, specifically white consumers. Now, despite this, while rap does may remain committed to the experiences of black Americans, there is the chance that its origins will be obfuscated. And I can't tell you the, the number of times I've heard that, oh, well, uh, rap started with Aerosmith or something, just like totally ignoring uh, Cool Herc or LL Cool J or uh, Grandmaster Flash, like ignoring all the big figures within rap music because there is a kind of cultural desire to make things white, to point to the origins of things as being white. And this happens as well, of course, with rock and roll, uh, where it's like, oh, Buddy Holly or Elvis or whatever were the progenitors of that um, that musical genre without paying real attention to the fact that rock as we know it is really derivative of R&B and blues, which set the stage for people like Eric Clapton and, and, and whatnot. So there is a kind of fascination on the part of white people for black culture, and they try to consume it and eat it up, as Bell Hooks says, that is, in the, in the form of eating the other. It becomes something to consume. And when jazz was emerging in the 20s, white people tried desperately to be a part of that culture. And there was also, therefore, in response to that, uh, the white presence within these spaces, there was also political and police resistance to the kind of urban life jazz was a part of. So, like, there were these politicians that were fearing that this, you know, this mingling of black and white people, which, of course, conflicted with everything that segregation stood for at that time, which really got these people uh, very, they were very sensitive to what was going on in terms of white and black people mingling and being a part of one another's culture. Now, as far as the other consequences of white appropriation of black music, there is the possible consequence, or there is the risk that white appropriation will negatively impact black artists because white musicians, white artists, have an easier time gaining access to record labels, booking stadiums, uh, agents, and you name it. From there, it's just so much easier for uh, white uh, artists to do that. So big labels tried um, to to essentially compete with smaller labels to, to no avail. So before figures like Eminem and Vanilla Ice, you know, white rappers, what was happening was that, you know, um, rap musicians were just producing their music in mostly independent form. And that really much continues to this day where, um, 
rappers are forced to kind of t develop the music in their own way with their own uh, capital with you know people in their community which also contributes to its um, being connected to those communities and then when it started to become popular then you saw people emerge like um, of course Vanilla Ice and Eminem that the big record labels were very quick to pick up just because of the opportunities they aff it afforded them. Now as I just mentioned, the big record labels tried to compete with the smaller ones, that is by drowning out competition uh, for uh, early these early rap artists in the 80s, but they, they didn't have much success because there was really something specific about the music that was being produced by people within their own communities. Now what the big record labels then did was they bought the smaller ones and they would buy these smaller labels but I'll granted them some degree of autonomy to say like you know you can make whatever you want but ultimately you're under the umbrella of I don't know whatever big record Sony we, whatever big record label we have here so production would be handled by the small label or the independent label but then marketing and distribution was taken up by um, by the big label and for an interesting discussion of this. Um, there's an interview with David Bowie on MTV in which he describes the ways that, uh, and we're going to get into this, but MTV would just refuse to play like black artists on their uh, their show on on their program, and then you saw things emerge like uh, Black Entertainment Television, which uh, BET for short. But David Bowie says like, "Well, why aren't you playing black artists?" And the interviewer is like, "Well." Uh, we're just trying to cater to Americans. And and David Bowie's like, well, aren't black people Americans too? Like, why aren't you considering them as well? But anyways, you can find that on YouTube and it's, it's, it's a good watch. So the kinds of stats that this interviewer was drawing upon that, you know, the real Americans watching, t watching these shows, watching MTV were white, was really, I guess influenced by the fact that white people could afford to you know each household could have like a television in their suburban home whereas in the black community because there was poverty was such a big issue uh there was a lot of sharing going on so people would probably watch these same shows in the same number but they would go over to a friend's house and watch uh television with their friends or that one person they knew that had a television and so on so the location of most of these uh, rap artists among the smaller labels that were experiencing a boom because of technological acquisition, there was kind of, as Rose describes it, a kind of trickle-down effect where these big labels coming out of the 60s and 70s with very big musical acts were the technology was kind of improving rapidly. And so a lot of the technology was growing obsolete, which made it easy for smaller labels to acquire what was at the time old but still in good working condition. And because of that, because of the fact that there was such a kind of independent explosion of uh, rap music production, it became difficult to actually assess not only how many people were consuming this music, but like who was producing it as well and how many, uh, you know, how many artists were out there. We just didn't have numbers on that. And it, it's not like this is exclusive to rap music. Like there are innumerable like rock bands uh, that tour around that no one's ever heard of, or just independent musicians that no one's ever heard of. But this got compounded, at least in the uh, black community at the time, where there was this really heavy emphasis on keeping things c kind of, maybe not deliberately, but keeping them insular. That is, rap music really spoke to the experiences of black Americans in urban settings, and so they were really remained popular only with that group for, for a little while. And then, of course, it got it would get appropriated and taken up uh, by white consumers as well. So it was only in the kind of late 80s when black artists started to actually take up airspace or take up kind of television space on MTV and whatnot with uh, artists like Prince and, and Michael Jackson that, you know, had a very big white following that is uh, the so-called popular, popular voices began to then find interest in this stuff and so it began to be played and they were at least like Michael Jackson and Prince were pretty safe options for a very sensitive white crowd like it wasn't like NWA or you know just 
Ice Cube or, or Dr. Dre on their own, who were releasing songs essentially calling for police violence or violence against the police. It, it, what you had with Michael Jackson and Prince were essentially uh, rock tunes that white people's ears were, were accustomed to that wouldn't offend them. Now, the entrance of black artists into the kind of uh, MTV space and in other uh, video broadcasting spaces meant that or, or kind of portended it, it uh, motivated a lot of developments within the black community specifically or previously black people had very difficult it was very difficult for black people to enter into like uh, professional video production programs and so they wouldn't actually gain that kind of knowledge but then when uh, black uh, black artists began to make videos for their songs and you know when they just began to uh, kind of produce their own music people had to learn within these communities how to do filmography how to do set design how to do prop design how to do uh, music um, I don't know, music uh, mixing had to, had to how to do proper recording and this kind of resulted in a boom of knowledge within these communities of these various technological feats and these various technological um, kind of skills so you'd have black artists with black filmographers, black recording uh, people that would essentially be working within their community. You know, they, a lot of in a lot of these scenes, for anyone that's you know ever watched um, old hip hop videos from like the '80s or '90s, be it Grandmaster Flash or Ghetto Boys or, or anything like that, what you see is a depiction of urban settings. Which, in Rose's words, satisfies poor young black people's profound need to have their territories acknowledged, recognized, and celebrated. And this essentially allows these spaces to be depicted in their own terms. That is, normally how these spaces are depicted are on like nightly news when the media machine is trying so desperately to um, kind of satiate the public demand for violence and crime by depicting violence and crime, by really taking up violence and crime as being, um, you know, demonstrating that journalists are doing their jobs, but it really serves the end of maintaining and reinforcing various prejudices that are held of urban settings and, and urban youth. Now, at the same time, of course, there were oppositionary forces that were saying like, oh, well, we can't play uh, rap music on MTV or on other radio stations because it's like sexist, because it calls for violence or something like that. And Rose is very much in agreement. She's like, yeah, of course, you can find examples of blatant sexism within rap. But she doesn't buy this argument because she's very curious and suspicious of the way that it is directly targeted against black musical production and how it isn't targeted against like country music that is extremely misogynistic in, in a lot of different ways or rock music for that matter where bands like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple have extremely uh, violent rhetoric against women uh, in a lot of their songs. Or maybe I shouldn't say a lot, but certainly enough of them to warrant uh, concern. So while yes, any musical genre can be criticized for being misogynistic, for being uh, racist or sexist, we should also be prepared to recognize this contradictory nature of rap music just like any other genre. So in that way, we can recognize the sexism present and we should negotiate that and try to uh, wrestle with that in order to make it better, of course. But at the same time, rap provides us with an alternative view of the machinations of the American sexism uh, machine in, in its own ways from both uh, male rap artists to, to women who are both describing in a lot of different ways the ways that, for instance, sexism permeates. So like, for example, maybe an example that would be surprising would be like Tupac, who has rapped very much about how like women are oppressed within uh, American culture and in many of their so um, other songs, how uh, it is necessary for like pro-choice to be a very uh, upfront within uh, the kind of American political uh, enterprise and, and so on and so forth. So in Rose's words, Rap offers alternative interpretations of key social events, such as the Gulf War, the Los Angeles uprising, police brutality, censorship efforts, and community-based education. 
all of which should be applauded for their efforts to call attention to forms of oppression, even if, you know, you can point to examples where um, oppression is maintained through sexist rhetoric or homophobic rhetoric or what have you. So rap is at the same time both part of the dominant text of society and yet always on the margins of this text, relying on and commenting on the text center, always aware of its proximity to the border. And that puts us here into chapter two. All aboard the night train, flow, layering, and rupture in post-industrial New York. So she starts at this chapter by saying that it is the tension between the cultural fractures produced by post-industrial oppression and the binding ties of black cultural expressivity that sets the critical frame for the development of hip hop. So it has been both regarded as a postmodern style, that is uh, rap and hip hop being a product of a kind of postmodern, post-industrial mindset or a kind of cultural framework. And it has also been recognized as embodying certain pre-modern um, pre -modern precepts in terms of like its reliance in terms of rap on the oral tradition and, and rhyming that are seen in, in a quite paternalistic way, in a patronizing way, as being emblematic of a kind of archaic form of musical production. So some people celebrate uh, rap's critique of consumerism, while the other, other people, I should say, criticize the way that rap valorized certain consumerist tendencies. Now, this is still speaking to the fact that within rap music, like every other genre, there are these contradictions here. So it's not like it's one or the other. It's not like rap is just the product of a postmodern, post-industrial age, or it is just kind of trying to harken back to a time when like um, uh, black people were not like under the same kind of oppressive framework they are now by trying to go back to these older forms of musical production. Rose doesn't buy any of these arguments or any of these perspectives because they're pretty problematic. Instead, she wants to maintain both of them at the same time. And in her words, she says that hip hop gives voice to the tensions and contradictions in the public urban landscape during a period of substantial transformation in New York at the time and attempts to seize the shifting urban terrain to make it work on behalf of the dispossessed. So using amplifiers, using recording equipment, uh, kind of playing upon the city's sounds and sights and representing them, sampling music, which we're going to get into because that's a tricky, tricky subject. But they use all of these tools to express themselves in their own way. And it is very, it, it is kind of hybrid like, like it takes from a bunch of different things to make its own thing. But because of that, it shouldn't be any less qualified as a distinct musical genre that can't be simply chalked up to any specific uh, explanation. Now, against some kind of critical perspectives that view rap as a kind of postmodern break, that is, as being the product of postmodern culture on the continuum of black music. So you had like previously you had jazz and blues, rock, R&B, and then they say that, well, Rap, uh, rap sexism and post-capitalist sentiments make it solely product of late capitalism. To this, Rose is, like, doesn't buy it at all, as I've kind of already said, but in, in her terms, I guess, she doesn't buy this argument because it forgets that uh, the same sentiments are found in jazz, blues, rock, R&B that are found in rap music as well. Additionally, she says that this dance kind of chooses to ignore the contradictions are inherent to all cultural production. It's not just found within rap music. So it's kind of weird that people, at least some of these commentators that she's pointing to are saying that, well, rap music is just contradictory. It doesn't seem to have this kind of strict, uh, stringent alliance with linearity. So it must be part of this kind of postmodern uh, moment. She doesn't buy that because she sees these contradictions everywhere. And thirdly, this perspective fails to specify the experiences of black youth in urban settings, chalking everything up to postmodernism, as though they don't have any autonomy on their own, they're just subjects to this broader economic turn. And this is because that rap music didn't just fall out of the sky. It is firmly rooted, or it shares its roots with uh, other forms of musical styles, both uh, primarily African-American musical styles and Afro-Caribbean musical styles that 
very much rely on the same themes found within hip-hop. And these include histories of dance, vocal articulations and instrumentation, and protest traditions that are all found in these previous musical genres. From, you know, I mentioned these two, but then, you know, the same things are found in jazz and blues and R&B as well. So how did hip-hop emerge, and how is it distinct from rap? So to put it briefly now, rap is a subset of hip-hop that includes graffiti and breakdancing alongside rap. So hip-hop is the big category, and hip-hop includes breakdancing, uh, graffiti art, and, uh, and rap. So rap is just a subset of hip-hop. And rap emerged alongside breakdancing and graffiti at a time when industrialization was being offshored, many people were losing their jobs on American soil, and neoliberalism was hitting uh, kind of critical mass. It was really gaining momentum. So there was decreased access to social programs and jobs for many urban youth as a result. And in New York, this was especially true where predatory lenders, landlords, architects, people who wanted to gentrify the city, push out black youth primarily by, you know, bulldozing buildings and putting up highways. Uh, they were essentially affecting greatly many different minorities, not just black people. So Rose mentions, of course, that uh, Jewish diasporas, Italian ones, um, and Irish ones as well, were, were experiencing great degrees of these forms of kind of systemic oppression where they were just erased off the map or, or attempted to be erased off the map by various politicians and urban planners and whatnot. And in Rose's words, hip-hop culture emerged as a source for youth of alternative identity formation and social status in a community whose older local support institutions had been all but demolished. So the old structures, the old kind of safety nets were being taken down. And then so what emerged in response were communities in the form of gangs, posses uh, to kind of establish a steady group identity and this this is very much true for a lot or for many of the different um, racialized groups in that time be they the Jewish people or Italian communities that had to rely on their own kind of group identity to maintain a degree of stability so but I should say in reference to rappers and gang names she says that taking on new names and identity offers prestige from below in the face of limited access to legitimate forms of status attainment. So they would rely on consumption, at least in the black community in the form of gangs, to craft specific images and styles for oneself. So consumption here was a way by which these people would essentially give themselves this identity that they were craving. So what characterizes hip hop and its subgenres that conforms disparate styles within that uh, community is a commitment to flow, layering, and ruptures in line. So breakdancing flows, it layers and breaks, same with rap and graffiti, and how these three attributes create and sustain rhythmic motion, continuity and circularity via flow, accumulate, reinforce and embellish this continuity through layering, and manage threats to these narratives by <clears throat> by building in ruptures that highlight the continuity as it momentarily challenges it. So these are some constitutive components of rap and hip hop, and that was specific in for Rose, I believe, to uh, black youth culture at the time that was different from black, or sorry, by Italian culture at the time, or Jewish culture at the time, where these groups were also experiencing these kinds of uh, forms of oppression, where with, in the case of black people, it, it was obviously much more intense because they were marked by not only their subordinate position, they were marked by their race as well. Now, someone might say to these so-called strategies to uh, maintain or to develop a kind of group identity, well, any resistive potential is usurped. It's kind of belied by these rappers' self-commodification. You know, they're just uh, buying into the system by trying to demonstrate their uh, group identity with stuff they've consumed. So Rose responds to these critics, anyone who might say that, by saying that it is naive and romantic to think that there was a kind of pre-commodity form, as though previously black people weren't always already engaged in commodity consumption, just like everybody else. 
So what changed was the transference of black self-commodification to black exploitation by largely white-owned corporations. So at a time when black people were starting to be criticized for taking on these kind of uh, so-called consumerist trends, even though Rose says, of course, this was happening before, was the same time in which black artists began to be exploited and really used by white artists, by white record labels, in order to make profit for themselves. But no one seems to have a problem with that. And it just attests to the fact that black people are put under much more, uh, a much closer magnifying glass. You know, they can't do anything wrong or they're going to uh, be punished for it. So the example that she gives is Vanilla Ice, who uh, who claimed to be from an urban setting uh, when in fact he, he didn't, and who um, who didn't write some of his songs, and I wasn't totally clear on the details, uh, some of his songs were written by black artists who he didn't pay, and it was only many years later that they actually got their money through litigation. So Rose is very suspicious of these efforts to call attention to rap music's commitment to the dominant structure, i.e. capitalism in this sense, without these people calling attention to the ways that black people were exploited and how they pretty much a, a means of survival. And she says that the same thing can be seen with like punk music as well, where like punk artists relied upon, uh, you know, consuming the right kind of leather and, and black garb but that didn't at all like detract from the messages that they were trying to convey in fact there's no one on this earth who can absolutely live off the grid and be a perfect like um, non-capitalist uh, perfect non-sexist or non-racist person like no one should have that expectation of anyone but it's it's just suspicious when people are being called out for it as they're trying to call out uh, oppression and it just reveals a reactionary tendency. That is when someone calls out, in this case, black people for committing themselves to the system instead of actually fully challenging it, you have to ask, would these people have been calling out the system prior to this moment? Or is it secretly about them only calling out black people? But anyways, before being appropriated, commodities were a means of self-expression. That is, in the case of black culture with graffiti, women graffiti artists had to put, uh, I guess they had to sport, they had to wear specific kinds of clothing, use specific colors and depict specific things to maintain legitimacy in the eyes of their male counterparts. So they had to rely on consumption in order to survive and thrive in the world. And similarly with breakdancing, women had to construct their, I guess their own style to not appear too masculine in the eyes of men. But when you have, I guess, trendsetters that are exclusively men at that time, it becomes difficult to, you know, craft your own space, your own identity. And in response, is this, this is kind of an aside, but in response to the emergence of graffiti in the 60s and 70s, uh, alongside rap, music, and hip-hop culture, uh, the city of New York spent millions on chemical deterrents that would like strip graffiti off of train cars and off of walls and stuff that was actually quite poisonous. Like it was poisoning people in these neighborhoods. Uh, but anyways, they, they did that. They installed barbed wire fences and at a time uh, even attack dogs. And you should only imagine like, well, what if those millions of dollars were actually spent on things like, I don't know, uh, better school equipment or social programs or after school programs. But anyways, I digress. Likewise, rap, I guess, relied heavily on access to technology, which could very easily be seen as committing oneself to the system at hand. Uh, but they needed it to make the music they want, like turntables, speakers, microphones. These were all necessary for rap's emergence. So after that time, of course, during this time in the mid 80s and onwards, rap began to be commercialized with the release of Rapper's Delight, which was in, um, it was 1979, uh, with more rappers entering contracts with big labels that often overworked black artists for little to no pay. And this was intensified. This was certainly magnified for women. So that's a kind of brief history of rap as it kind of emerged and that I think I'll stop there just before chapter three, uh, Soul Sonic Forces, Tech Orality and Black Cultural Practice and Rap Music, which I'll take up from that point uh, next time. So if you made it this far, thank you for listening. Uh, if I did anything wrong, I'd love to, you know, if you're willing to put in the work, 
to tell me about it. Uh, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.